Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth edition of Story Maps Live. My name is Ross Donahue, and I'm on the Story Maps team. I'll be your host for this webinar. Um, a few housekeeping items as we get started. We'll be using both the chat and the Q&A function here in Zoom. Now, the Q&A function is specifically for questions that you might have for the Story Maps team or for our panelists today. Um, the chat functionality is for having a conversation in terms of, you know, if you want to say how you like a certain feature or you don't like a feature, or if you want to give feedback to, um, to us as we get going. Now, my colleagues and I are standing by to answer any questions that you have um, throughout this webinar, and we will be recording it um, and we'll make it available at the conclusion. The general structure for the webinar is as follows. We'll start with a brief overview of ArcGIS Story Maps by Alan Carroll, who's the founder of Story Maps. Then we'll hear from our featured storytellers from the Grand Canyon Trust. Afterwards, we'll give a live demonstration of the latest enhancements to ArcGIS Story Maps. And we'll end with a live Q&A. Now, without any further ado, I want to turn it over to the founder of ArcGIS Story Maps, Alan Carroll. Thanks, Ross. Let me share my screen here. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. I'm going to move kind of quickly because uh, we want to get to the really awesome stuff that the Grand Canyon Trust uh, is going to share with us today. But uh, first, a little bit of background. Uh, I think probably most of you are familiar with story maps, but just in case, I'm going to go over the basics. Uh, so story maps combine interactive maps, also, by the way, static maps. Uh, it's your choice. Uh, maps that are hosted on Esri's cloud service, ArcGIS Online, with your multimedia content, so photos, videos, and audio, and text, of course, to tell stories about the world, all sorts of stories at all sorts of scales, all sorts of topics. They work on a variety of screen sizes. So in other words, they're responsive. It's best to author them on large screens, but you can view them just as easily on mobile devices and tablets as well as PCs. And to me, this is the secret sauce. They incorporate interactive builders uh, so that you can piece together a really beautiful, a very polished multimedia story uh, block by block using our block palette, which is kind of the heart of our builder function. So in other words, you don't need to know any JavaScript or CSS or anything like that. Uh, they're hosted by Esri in the cloud on ArcGIS Online. That doesn't mean we own the content. It's your content, but it's just a convenient place to park it. You don't have to worry about maintaining servers and all that boring stuff. Uh, we started about uh, nine years ago with, uh, uh, and we released in series uh, what we now call the classic apps, each of which represented a different single user experience, each of which had its own builder. But about a year ago, we launched a next generation story maps with several things in mind. One was to make the experience more consistent, to uh, combine everything within a single builder function so that within a single story map, you can kind of mix and match these different user experiences. We also optimized it for mobile and we worked very hard to make the builder as, uh, as fun and intuitive to use as possible. We've had a really exciting ride. It's been thrilling to watch so many of you embrace our stor storytelling platform. So we've gone from about 120 stories to well over a million uh, before the end of 2019, or we're now above 1.3 million, with many more story maps actually behind uh, firewalls that we can't count. Uh, it's also been thrilling to see that many, many organizations have uh, embraced story maps. Uh, including leading nonprofits in the conservation and other realms like Audubon and Nature Conservancy and Doctors Without Borders. Lots of federal agencies, uh, state and local governments are using story maps. NOAA and EPA both have literally hundreds of story maps across their sprawling websites. But we work with many other groups. Uh, many groups, of course, are just creating story maps without any kind of direct interaction with us, but we, we love hearing from people. Um, so it's been really exciting to see. Uh, one more really exciting thing to, to share is that story maps have really taken off in the education realm and that many teachers, uh, high school and colleges especially, are assigning their students story maps as a really exciting alternative to traditional research papers. 
Uh, we'll talk to you more if time permitting about places to go, but you can find us at esri.com slash story maps. So that's the basics. Um, I'm going to talk very, again, very briefly and forgive me quickly about the myriad uses of story maps. And these, uh, these represent some of the uses. Uh, it's been fun sometimes to discover surprising ways that people are putting uh, story maps to use. So one, one and perhaps the most common one is public engagement. So simply letting people know about something that, that, we've, that, that you as an individual or an organization feel it's important for people to know about. Um, a sort of subset of that is activism. Uh, when you really want to, uh, want to be more uh, kind of activist and even partisan, uh, and your st stories like this are more likely to have a, an action at the end of them, like sign a petition or donate or volunteer or join us on the picket lines, you name it. Uh, story maps are also being used more and more as briefings and presentations. And of course, I'm showing you this, I'm presenting this to you as story maps. Uh, and in fact, my team and I have pretty much given up on PowerPoint because we think story maps are a pretty cool way to uh, uh, make a presentation. Um, they're also, as I mentioned, used a lot in education. This is one of thousands of student produced story maps. This is a guy, a high school senior did just an amazing story map uh, on the, uh, the mapping he did of his, his local campus using, uh, using drones and GIS. Um, also, they're great for personal narratives. So this is a colleague of ours on our team who did a, uh, made a, a vacation to Mexico and came back and told the story of his, uh, his vacation. Whenever I go on a trip, uh, when I come home, my fingers itch until I uh, create a story map of it. Um, they're also useful for online guides. So uh, there's a, uh, an immersive within story maps called guided tour that allows you to uh, present, say, an historic neighborhood like Georgetown in Washington, D.C., or any number of uh, uh, like trail guides and things like that. Um, story maps, of course, are useful as atlases, so you can pre present, a, say, a series of related thematic maps that makes it easy for people to browse and compare. Um, another way of kind of aggregating content within story maps is what we call a sort of binder app. So, uh, for instance, emergency responders may need a quick access to a bunch of different resources, not just maps, but things like dashboards and stuff. And so story maps become a convenient place to sort of gather material together in under one URL that people find easy to uh, easy to find and peruse. Uh, it's also a great way to introduce your team. So this is uh, the, uh, there's a really cool collection, and that's another function of story maps that that we re they're really uh, are proud of. You can collect a series of stories onto a collection page, and Tufts University featured their environmental studies major, each of whom is featured in a short story map. Um, and in fact, you can go one further and, and essentially create a story book. So uh, this is an ocean conservation uh, nonprofit that, um, that aggregated or created a story map for each one of its so-called hope spots, uh, places in the oceans that it feels are especially important to protect and put them together as, so that each story is almost like a chapter in a book. Uh, story maps can be useful even as web pages. So occasionally we see, and we'd like to see more of this, story maps that, that have a sort of full screen embed. And uh, the uh, International League for Conservation Photographers did this. So all they have is a header representing their site-wide navigation, the story, and, the, and then a footer at the end. And so the story looks like it's completely integrated into their website, which it is, of course. Story maps can also be used for simple crowdsources. Uh, so you can combine story maps with another one of Esri's web apps called Survey123. Uh, and so in this case, we embedded a survey directly into a story, invited people for Earth Day to share their favorite Earth place or a place in nature. And then they, they submit their photograph with a brief description and it appears on a map. There are lots of potential uses for that. Uh, businesses are presenting their projects or portfolios or real estate agents are listing their, uh, their properties or houses or buildings for sale within the story maps. They're also very useful as uh, we've, again, I've been doing right now for instructional purposes. So we've got a story map called Getting Started with ArcGIS Story Map that runs people through the process of creating a story. 
Uh, and then finally, although again, this isn't the last use, but, uh, but one that we like, we've seen more and more of these, is that uh, people say fresh out of graduate school are creating story maps that story maps as resumes. So uh, uh, they'll present their their experience in the form of maps and pictures and text, et cetera. Uh, we've gotten to know Amanda, and she used a story map to good effect to uh, to gain uh, a, get a nice job in uh, in Minnesota. So that's uh, that's a quick tour. There are many other uses, uh, some of them pretty amusing and surprising. But uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it back over to Ross. Take it away. Thanks a lot, Alan. So the next segment of our, of our webinar is all about our featured storytellers. So I'm really excited to introduce our featured storytellers, Serena Riggs, Stephanie Smith, and Ellen Hein from the Grand Canyon Trust. Uh, they recently published a story map titled Voices of the Grand Canyon, which uses narrative audio to elevate the voices of tribal communities. Uh, so join me in welcoming them to Story Maps Live. Thanks, Russ. Um, I will, um, if Saran and Ellen want to introduce themselves, and then I'll jump into our presentation. Hi, Yate. My name is Saran Riggs. I am from the Navajo Nation here in Arizona. Uh, I work at the Grand Canyon Trust as the Grand Canyon Program Manager and I'm happy to be here. Hi, I'm Ellen Hine, and I am the Communications Manager at the Grand Canyon Trust based in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I am Stephanie Smith. I am the GIS Program Director. I am based in Denver. And uh, bear with me, I'm going to share my screen now, and we will kick off. Move you all off my screen. <laughs> um, so, first of all, thank you, Story Maps team, for inviting us um, here today. Um, it really is an honor to uh, be able to talk in front of my peers um, about this story. Um, I would first like to say, though, the real featured storytellers um, are Loretta, Colleen, Nikki, Lee, and Jim that are in voices. Um, we'd like to thank them for contributing their voice to make the voices of Grand Canyon possible and allowing us all to read, listen, watch, and learn from their experiences. For me personally, this was truly an honor to work on this project and to continue my educational journey. Uh, we also would like to thank Deidre Peaches from Paper Rocket Productions for her photography and videography. This wouldn't be possible without her. Um, I'd like to preface that we are not here today to speak on behalf of Native peoples or the individuals who shared their stories with us, for theirs are not our stories to tell. We are here to demonstrate how we use Story Maps platform to host the stories that were shared with us. So, I'm sure many of you joining us today uh, likely haven't heard of the Grand Canyon Trust or maybe not familiar, very familiar with us. So I'll give a brief introduction. We are a conservation advocacy organization with a mission to safeguard the wonders of the Grand Canyon and the Colorado Plateau while supporting the rights of Native peoples. We envision a Grand Canyon and Colorado Plateau where wildness and diversity of Native plants and animals, clean air and flowing rivers abound, sovereign tribal nations thrive, a livable climate endures, and people passionately work to protect the region they love for future generations. We are an organization rooted in geography, and that's the Colorado Plateau. While it's difficult to draw a hard line around the plateau region, for the trust, it is generally situated in the four corner states and defined by Southern Utah, the Western Slope of Colorado, Northern Arizona, and Northwestern New Mexico. Most people recognize the plateau as canyon country for its desert landscapes, deep canyons, and towering buttes. The majority of the land across the plateau are public lands with iconic locations like Grand Canyon, Arches, Zion, Canyonlands, and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. 
It is also home to incredible alpine areas like the San Francisco Peaks, the Monroe Mountain, the La Salles outside of Moab, and the Abajos and Bears Ears. 32% of the land on the Colorado Plateau is reserved for over 13 tribal nations. At the Grand Canyon Trust, we recognize the entire plateau as the ancestral homeland of many native peoples on and off the plateau. And we are standing behind them as they reclaim their authority to manage their ancestral lands. So it's an honor to have Sarana here today to share that focus for the trust and some of the background on the evolution of the Voices Project. Sarana. Thank you, Stephanie, for that introduction. Um, well, I guess our role in, um, with the trust and how we highlight the indigenous voice and the perspectives and the, the cultural um, resources that we're, we're saving from, you know, from, from where I come from, the Navajo tribe, uh, we're doing everything we can to preserve our language, preserve our, our culture and the traditions and everything that's been instilled to us um, and handed down generations through generations. Um, so we also are, we also take care of the land and we do what we can to preserve the land because that's a part of us and that's where we come from. Uh, we have many stories that, that talk about our origin of how we are, how we came to, to be in this place and we, you know, we're doing all that we can do to protect this place and how do we go about that? How do we, how do we go about teaching, um, our next generations and how do we go about teaching myself, and my, my kids and my, you know, the next generation beyond this. Um, and what do we do in that teaching role? And so with the Grand Canyon Trust, we are support, um, a support base for many tribal communities out there on the Colorado Plateau. Uh, we support them in, in ways as uh, addressing environmental threats like uranium mining, um, depletion of aquifers from mining, uh, contamination of water sources, uh, looking at air quality and looking at um, ways to help um, look into conservation efforts and look at um, how we look at management and do co-management um, from a community base and not just agency to agency. So there's many different ways that the trust supports um, these tribal communities and it's through their voice through the tribal communities and through the individuals um, and the different different voices of the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon ha is, ha is affiliate, affiliated with 13 um, uh, tribal nations so that's 13 tribal languages 13 languages and there's 13 names for everything and there's 13 13 perspectives um, how do we how do we look at those different perspectives, and how do we best support um, these different voices? Um, so, in this slide here, you see that we had started off um, our intertribal centennial uh, gathering conversation, and within this uh, group here, there's the, the thirteen different tribes who have talked about um, what is it that they see in in this education. Of long-term objectives and goals. Um, and those three we talked about, uh, education, and we talked about um, economy, and we talked of uh, stewardship management, and how do we co collaboratively work together with these different agencies um, in this management of the Grand Canyon and also the Colorado Plateau. And what do we, how do we go back to the education model? And it's always gonna be education in any work that we do. And how do we, how do we take that step into into telling the story right, into telling and highlighting our voices um, on on the ground and letting people know who we are and that we're still here. Um, so, with the Grand Canyon Trust and with the help of Stephanie and Ellen, we are working towards that that goal of highlighting our voices and highlighting, having the, having the communities highlight their voices in storytelling of the uses of traditional, um, traditional teachings of how to utilize the plants and 
the things that are out there and how we advocate effectively and how we teach others on what these, what the plants and the landscape and the many uses that it offers us. And also um, ensuring that the cultural knowledge that we have will continue. <laughs> and so um, with this story map, it is, I, I feel like it's a really effective tool to, to utilize and to have our youth um, uh, pick up and to carry forth with them because there's many there's many teachings that we have to 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 um, to teach uh, Stephanie can you get the next slide All right. Ellen's going to give us a little bit of background and um, specifically in centennial gatherings um, behind voices okay Ellen, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, as Sarah had mentioned, a group of Native leaders came together uh, to talk about the centennial of Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, Grand Canyon National Park turned 100 years old in 2019. Um, and Sarah, did you want to just briefly mention kind of the um, overall goal of the group? Yeah, I had just kind of covered that, but um... Grand Canyon National Park had their um, their hundredth centennial celebration uh, last year, and in in response to that, there was a lot of talk about um, what it is that the Grand Canyon National Park wanted to highlight, and that was not the indigenous perspective, but it was about the people who discovered the Grand Canyon and who have um, created this foundation of Grand Canyon National Park as we see today. Um, so in response to the celebration, the 13 affiliated tribes had talked about where is our voices, where, where, why are we not highlighted in this perspective here? Um, and so, as I had mentioned, this group had came together and we discussed how we can highlight and enhance our voices. And, with, and I did mention those three objectives. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Rana. Um, So at one of the centennial uh, gathering meetings. We interviewed several Native leaders about the work that they were doing in that group and their vision for the Grand Canyon for the next 100 years. And a theme very clearly emerged in asking the question, what do you want people to know in the centennial year and beyond? Uh, and so Ophelia Wadahamaji Corliss said, I want people to know that the cultural history of the Grand Canyon is not the history you read in colonial books. Ned Kabodi said, I would love to see an increase in the awareness of the First Nations cultures and our relationships to the canyon. And Renee Yellowhorse said, talk to me, ask me about my history. Ask me about how I feel about the canyon. Don't ask a historian, don't ask an archeologist. That's not Dene or a native, ask me, I'm right here. And so really that became the framework for the Voices Project. We wanted to ask, ask the questions that uh, Renee was kind of alluding to, and we wanted the world to hear those stories, perspectives, and histories that the Centennial Gatherings group wanted to tell. Um, so the first person narrative form became, and really is, the heart of the project. Uh, and another goal of creating the collection was to showcase that there's not a singular Indigenous connection to the Grand Canyon. Uh, there are stories and ties in every of the 13 affiliated tribes that Saran mentioned, um, stories stacked as high as the canyon rooms themselves. So really, then we wanted the Voices of Green Canyon to be an invitation for people to listen and learn. And personally, I'm extremely grateful for all of the opportunities I've had through the Voices Project uh, and my work at the Trust generally to learn about Native cultures uh, on the Colorado Plateau and that learning never stops. Uh, and so we wanted the Voices Project to help set people on their own journeys uh, to challenge their assumptions, broaden horizons, and hopefully to get them asking questions of their own. So we've been using the RGS Story Maps platform since 2014, but this was our first production with a new layout. Um, Ellen and I have teamed up on the 100 images of Grand Canyon kicking off the centennial year last year, 
Uh, prior to that, um, we produce uh, a series of two, uh, Grand Canyon Threatened Waters, um, Grand Canyon Steeps and Springs, and the Keep the Canyon Grand. Uh, the Story Maps application allows every story to have its own unique URL, as many of you know. That's much like its own web page. Uh, for a product like Voices, it was important to us that the individual storytellers highlighted in the story map had the ability to take ownership of their story and share it how they wanted. So before we could create the story map though, uh, we had to record the stories. Uh, and it's important that we acknowledge two things about recording the stories here first. Uh, is a decade's worth of work in the Trust Native America and Grand Canyon programs. Um, the intertribal gatherings, the centennial conversations work that Saranda described, all of that really laid the groundwork and established the trust and relationships that were truly essential uh, to going out and uh, recording the stories for this project. And secondly, uh, we approached these interviews knowing that not all stories are appropriate to share with the general audience. Um, there are different levels of cultural knowledge and since story map, the story maps platform is a very public uh, platform, we needed to make sure that what we recorded aligned uh, with cultural values and teachings and everyone who was involved felt comfortable with what we were sharing. So we worked with Deidre Peaches, a fantastic Diné filmmaker who traveled all around the Grand Canyon region to capture these five storytellers on camera, both in video and stills. And the resulting stories in a variety of media forms is what went into the Voices of Grand Canyon. Thank you, Ellen. So now I'm gonna go into a live demonstration of the story map and discuss some specifics. So bear with me for just a second as I switch screens here. Okay. With this type of project, it was vital that we stay true to elevating the first person voices, as Ellen mentioned, and the feature storytellers as much as possible. We accomplished this by hosting lots of audio clips. So if you've interacted in here, you will see lots of these audio clips embedded within the story, as well as video clips and quotes directly from the storytellers. I wanted to be very careful in my layout choices as as story map builders, you can move any of these features into any position or draw attention to specific things as you see fit. But that is impactful to how the story flows and the message that comes across. And so I wanted to be very careful with that and to make those kind of changes to me felt disingenuous. So just as Ellen took great care to limit narration, I wanted to ensure that all the images were directly tied to what was being referenced by the storyteller and to highlight and that the highlighted text that you see here in quotes from Jim Enote, as an example, elevated the individual story. Most of the images in the story that you see, like this one here, um, as Ellen mentioned, were taken by Deidre. And this helped to establish consistency and flow throughout each person's stories. Other images, let me scroll up, like this landscape image, were really only used to give a sense of place. So Jim in and Jim Inno's story, it's mentioned Zuni Valley, and this is Zuni Valley. We could also jump to Nikki Cooley's story. And in this, she mentions that people are often surprised to hear that communities lived in the Grand Canyon and so I chose a photo in Grand Canyon to demonstrate for the visual learners that yes, in fact, people live in the Grand Canyon and did live in the Grand Canyon. Overall though, I didn't want to distract from the individual stories. So you'll find the images and maps are minimal throughout the entire layout. Uh, let's talk a little bit about style consistency. This is a very important factor to me with these. I wanted each individual story to flow together, but feel unique and stand alone, but also be able to be a part as an entire collection. So um, the way I accomplished this is every single story starts with um, this slideshow um, option within the application. Even though I'm only highlighting one image, I could have used the sidecar here, but I chose this because I knew I wanted it to be full width and bold at the start of each story. But the last thing I wanted was this big box to be covering the storyteller's face. So with slideshow, I had more control over where that block appeared throughout each of these sections. 
there was lots of experiment experimenting in this layout. Um, I had a lot of extra great content, like images, maps, audio files, extra video clips that we ended up not using. And what we found is too much content or too much interactivity actually distracted from the person's story. So for instance, I did experiment with a slideshow to highlight more of the wonderful photography, but I found that it disrupted the flow of the story overall. I noticed I personally lost my place in the individual stories because I was looking at photographs um, and thought that that would happen to someone else too. So overall with story products, um, if I feel a pause or an awkwardness in the flow, then it's a cue to me that likely the viewers are going to feel that as well. And to me, that's a sign that I need to refine something. Um, let's jump to audio for a second. Um, so yeah, audio is a huge role in the story. At the time that we built Voices, uh, there was not an option uh, for audio to be uploaded into the application. So if you've been playing with new features, you've probably noticed something different. Um, I think that's gonna be highlighted a little later. Um, but at the time that this was launched, I, did, I couldn't upload it into the application. So we looked for a third party platform where we could host the audio clips and use the iframe embed feature in the application. We chose SoundCloud. Uh, after testing how the embedded clips would function and what it would look like in the application. And there were a few things that we were specifically looking for with this. Um, we wanted it to be clean, uncluttered, um, and control over the display and design of the embed itself. So to give you an example, um, SoundCloud allows you to have sharing or commenting on the specific soundbite. We did not want that um, within the middle of the story, especially since we were using lots of audio files. The other thing SoundCloud allows is this really large view instead of this little thumbnail that becomes a background to your audio file. I found that to be intrusive. And so um, I definitely wanted to be able to control that. So if you Bear with me one more moment. I'll actually go live in the back end and just show you what that embed looked like for us. So under properties, when you look at this iframe embed, it actually took me quite a bit of trial and error to actually get this how I wanted it. Um, I, there's an autoplay function that we had to ensure that we turned to false. There's showing the comments turn to false. Um, some of these other things that I didn't even know what they were at first, like show user or show repost. And so after trying this over and over, I discovered that I really wanted it streamed down um, as much as possible. The other thing um, I had to experiment with, if anyone, hopefully this helps you and saves you some time, uh, the height of the embed. So I had to, through trial and error again, try this over and over until I got the height to be um, at a place where it didn't have a lot of white space at the bottom of the embed itself, creating kind of a awkward experience for the user when they were looking at the story. Um, the other thing to think about when, it's, when you're embedding third-party content, and this was really important to us to think about, um, so I'll share this with you. We, there is a downside to third party options that you embed. Um, it does take a bit of time to upload all of this material um, to that, that hosting site. And then you need to customize the title, description, the thumbnail image, all of that information. Because remember, this is public on that third party site as well. So you don't want to forget that. But then you need to also customize that information within the card here in the application because that's really important um, for the user experience. Um, but there's also a positive side to uh, hosting it in a third party application because then it's, it's there, it's permanent um, in that and you can use it in different stories or you can use it on a website or uh, social media post, etc. But you do have to remember that it's still content that you have to manage because you have a whole new site that's public and don't forget about it. Um, I'll bounce back over here um, where I'm not logged in. Um, so a lot of times in a lot of our map and a lot of our story maps, we do have a lot of map content and it's a map driven story. 
For this story, it is not. And MAPS really took a back seat. Uh, the GIS program um, at the Trust has a policy that we do not map cultural resources because that is not our place. And drawing boundary lines on a map can be problematic. So anytime I'm talking to fellow geographers or cartographers, I always come back to the words of Jim Enote. Um, in a book, um, maybe some of you are familiar with this, it's called Mapping Our Places. And I'm going to read a quote from that book. Indigenous peoples have always had maps. We've had songs, chants, prayers, migration stories, shell arrangements, drawings on hides, drawings on wood and stone. These maps aid our memories. They give reference to our places of origin places we've visited, the places we hope to go. They also provide us with a reference of where we are within the universe and help to define our relationship to natural processes surrounding us. And because they're ours, they function in our own languages and use scales we can relate to. But over the past 500 years, we've been remapped. So as a reminder, that's the words of Jim Enote in the book, Mapping Our Places. So in designing the layout for voices, I really take these words to heart. Um, I was very careful in what maps were used and how they were used. And actually, funny story, first edition did not have maps at all. <laughs> but we changed that later on with some guidance from Ellen. <laughs> the maps that are in the story are purposefully small and very understated. So I'll we'll jump over to an example here. Design-wise, I actually had to add a lot of white space around the map image itself um, because I wanted these to be smaller than what the application thought the smallest uh, size should be. So I went in, added a buffer of white space to the image, and this forced the application to make it appear as if it was smaller um, than what actually is allowed in this um, side area. I intentionally labeled the Zuni, Diné, Hopi, Havasupai, and Wallapai lands as present day to attempt to directly address that where the native peoples live today are not their full homelands. I'll jump to Nikki Cooley for a second again. And if you'll notice here in the Diné map, I used the Navajo language for the peeps. And here's another example where I did some experimenting I did try an interactive map here, um, but it didn't work for several reasons. Uh, first, as Nikki shares in her story, these landmarks are sacred. And while some may argue that these peaks are well known and wildly, ma widely mapped in many different ways, it felt wrong to highlight them, especially in a map that was interactive and in this specific setting. And in my testing, it gave me pause in a disruptive way to the voice of the storyteller. I ended up interacting with the map instead of focusing on the storyteller or listening to the audio or watching the video files. So I scratched that idea immediately. So as geographers, cartographers, visual storytellers, I know that the details call us, but sometimes knowing what to leave off the map or story map is just as important as what you put in it. We have a responsibility as content creators and designers to understand and respect these culturally sensitive in information and design accordingly. Remember, this is public. If you in, in sh uh, unsure about what to do, seek the guidance of those that you are working with and always get permission. So um, experimenting continued after we launched the story map. Soon after we published Voices, um, as we released the new features, like the navigation bar option that you see here that I've been using. Initially, we didn't have this option and it was a little unclear of how to um, have navigation where the user really had control and we weren't deciding what order people would interact with the story. But with the navigation bar, you can click between any, any one of the stories in any order that you would like. So as soon as I saw that update, I quickly added that navigation into the story. Another example of this is the April Story Maps Live Edition, or I saw Kathy Carroll use the collections feature. I immediately thought this was a fantastic way to allow the user to decide how they wanted to consume these stories and further highlight each storyteller individually. You can now find a collection 
for the voices of the Grand Canyon. I accomplished this by using the great story duplication feature. Thank you guys for adding this in. Without this feature, it would have taken me weeks of work to build each one of these stories again from scratch. But with duplication, I can make a copy of the original version and then delete the content I didn't need, thus building each individual story. Technical logistics. We separated the voices um, into having the introduction as a separate story map, and each individual storyteller has their own story. The other thing you will notice if you look at the collection, the design is still consistent with the original story that is both in the introduction as well as each of the featured storytellers. The other thing we added, I don't, if you've noticed, at the end of each of the story, there is a call to action for those that have a cultural connection to Grand Canyon, and if they would like to add their voice to this collection and story. So with this collection, we can add any new voices um, that want to speak up and be heard. Um, and lastly, I will wrap up with one last design element is the integrated um, bookends at the, in at the introduction and at the end of the story that really sandwich the storytellers and separate them from that intro and conclusion. And this is the uh, custom designed graphic. And I point this out because it's a little fun Easter egg, at least to me. Uh, this is actually the soundbite wave um, from Jim Enote's interview on the term Pueblo and people. And the colors, if you turn it vertically, are the colors of the canyon and represent the different geologic layers. It's completely me being nerdy. <laughs> so with that, I will pass it back to Serena to add her concluding thoughts on how Native communities can use story maps in future projects. Thank you, Stephanie and Ellen again for all the hard work and uh, Deidre. Um, this has been really a really great project. Um, like I said, it started with the Intertribal Centennial Group wanting to highlight their voices and uplift their voices and to share it with everybody out there and also a, a chance to to have an idea to utilize the same tool within our own communities um, we during this time of covid we are now interacting face to face like this in a safe in our safe homes and our safe workspaces um, and how do we how do we now share the knowledge that we have um, with you know with I mean, again, COVID is not good in any tribal community and we're losing elder voices and knowledge is being lost and we don't have time to grasp all of those, those stories that have to be shared. And with tools like this, you know, we, we have the opportunity to, to share what we can, but in the most sensitive way as possible. There's a lot to share, but there's a lot that, that cannot be shared. But what we can share, we can utilize this. Um, and we have a lot of many educated youth who who are very, who utilize all these tools out there on the web. And they have all this knowledge and they, they're into computer graphics and all this stuff. And, you know, I feel like this is, this is the perfect tool in this time of social distancing to, to share what we have and to share and carry that knowledge forward. Um, so I'm really, I'm really happy that this project had happened. And I had shared this with many other family members and other community members to have them look at this and to, to learn from it. And, you know, let's, let's let our youth know that there's other job opportunities out there aside from what we're, we were used to. There's a lot of things that we can utilize out there. Um, to, to share our voice. Yeah. Again, thank you, Stephanie and Ellen. Serena, and I think we'll pass it off to Ross now. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories with us and the amazing and inspiring work that you're doing. We have time for a couple of questions from the audience. We received a number of them as we, uh, as you guys were speaking. And so I wanna take some time to share those with you um, and then we'll move on with the rest of the programming. So first, um, Amy Nichols 
wrote in to Serena. Hi, Serena. My given name is Amy, and I'm a member of the Samish Nation. My homeland is Samish Island. Could you speak more to navigating the line between? Sorry, everything just jumped. Uh, where go? I think it erased. Oh, it says, could you speak more to navigating the line between knowledge that can be shared and not shared this way? And or what type of stories does this platform lend itself to more easily? Um, yeah, as Stephanie and Ellen had mentioned to myself, is that when we're when we are mm, the interview questions that we have for the intertribal centennial group and the people that they recommend, we are very cautious and careful of what is shared and not shared. Um, in, in many different um, tribal communities and different uh, tribes, there's there's sen very sensitive information um, to 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 youth, adolescents, and adults, and also gender roles. So we have to be very careful on what those what the stories are and who the audience is that's going to hear this. Um, and so we we do have guidance with our tribal elders and the historic preservation offices of the different tribal communities or the different tribal nations. So we are being very cognizant of what type of information we share. And we more look at it as this is the public. So we, what do you want to share to the public that's okay to share to the public? Um, the last question, I'm not sure what you, mean by that one and maybe that could be a Stephanie or Ellen yeah I think you answered that in your closing okay. remarks too. Sorry. thanks so much um, another question how long did this process take you from start to finish uh, maybe Stephanie or Ellen let Ellen answer her side and then I can give my answer <laughs> um, from start to finish, from kind of starting to set up interviews to completion was probably about nine months. And building wise, um, I probably had about a, a solid month's worth of time put into the building aspect and testing. Excellent, thanks. Um, okay, another question. I know that one of the growing problems in the Grand Canyon space is either the new construction of tourism and nuclear plants. How has uh, Grand Canyon Trust and the native people in that area uh, fought back or compromised those things? Uh, okay, question. Okay, um, we don't have any nuclear uh, power plants that are proposed, but we do have a lot of um, a lot of developments that are proposed. We have addressed Canyon Mine, which is a a, a ore a ore mine that has not yet taken um, ore out of the mine because due to um, a hitting a perch aquifer, which flooded the mine. Um, until that dries out, production is at a halt. Uh, we have dealt with Escalade um, development, which is a tram that was proposed down into the Grand Canyon at the confluence of the Little Colorado and the main uh, stem of the Colorado River. And that was voted down by the Navajo Nation Council as, and that the, the voices that pushed that were the people that lived in the area and that had livestock in the area. Um, and of course, the many surrounding communities and um, a lot of advocating from those who reside in the area and educated the whole Navajo Nation. And also it brought together a collaboration of other tribal voices from the 13 or 12 other tribes affiliated with Grand Canyon. So not only was Escalade a bad idea, but it in a way it was good because it brought it unified all our voices again and now made us to a point where we can be unified in a lot of other issues like the hydroelectric uh, dam proposal that's 
propose on the LCR, and of course, um, Canyon Mine and many other things that are happening um, to our water sources in Grand Canyon. And as the trust, we, we're doing what we can to support them in any way we can. Great, thank you. Thank you all so much for taking these questions and taking the time today to present your really inspiring work. Um, for those of you on the webinar, I'm posting a link um, to the chat about how you can support uh, tribal communities facing COVID-19. There's lots of other uh, links in there that are uh, really helpful for learning more and exploring the amazing work that Green King and Trust is doing. Uh, Serena has also provided her email. If you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to her directly. So with that, we'll move to the demo portion of, of the webinar. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and show you the latest enhancements that have come to ArcGIS Story Maps. So for those of you who are just getting started with Story Maps, the best way to navigate to it is to type in to, the, to a browser window, esri.com slash storymaps. This will take you to our landing page. Here you can learn about story maps. You can explore stories like the ones that were presented today by the Grand Canyon Trust on our Explore Stories page. You can also go to our Resources tab and learn more about both storytelling tips as well as how to build your skills using um, ArcGIS Story Maps. Um, and you can launch the, the builder directly from uh, that website. Now I'm going to go into a demo story map that I've made um, to, to do this demonstration just because we have limited amount of time. Um, the first feature that I'm really excited to show is one called the swipe block. And so those of you who are familiar with how you assemble a story map, um, you use this uh, content block option to add various types of content, whether it's text, multimedia, or immersive blocks. And this, with the latest release, we have a swipe block feature where you can have two maps side by side and you can visualize uh, different information on those maps. Now, this is a really powerful tool for showing things like change over time, um, as well as um, other information for your readers. I'm going to show briefly how you do this. So I'm going to add a new content block. I'm going to navigate to swipe beta. It's currently in beta. There are refinements being made, but it is fully operational. You can use it already in your projects. Um, so here I'm going to uh, add in a sea level rise map on one side. And at any point you can edit the layers that are visible to turn them on and off. So on one side I'm just going to zoom in and show the city of Norfolk. And on the other side I'm going to show that inundation data, that sea level rise data. And I'm going to show this two foot scenario. Now this is the amount of water that's projected to happen by 2040 in the city of Norfolk. And so as you pan around, you can see you can both swipe as well as navigate around If we look at it live, you can see that um, it's really clean and uh, easy to, to show your readers this information. Another demo story that I put together is one called Sounds of the Wild West. Um, now, we recently published this story map, and this story really features the new audio 
um, integration into story map. So audio is also in beta mode, but what happens is you can have both inline audio, something that maybe looks like this, as well as background audio. And so when a reader goes to play the background audio, they can click there, and hopefully you can hear that there are these ambient sounds playing behind it. Now to be able to incorporate this into your story map, it's really easy. Um, we're excited to see how the story maps community uses this feature. Essentially, you expose your various slides, click on these three dots, add background audio, and browse to a file, click add, and then it's as simple as that. So I just added some audio behind that, that wolf. And so you can both add audio as a background, but you can also add it inline using the block content. Um, and you can move this around as well. Another new feature is the ability to drag your immersive sections to different parts of your story. So as you are assembling them and changing up your layout and design, it's now easier than ever to um, move a, a different section, uh, a different immersive section to a different spot. Um, Again, all you have to do is click these uh, dots over here and you can drag it to a different section in your story map. Um, I'm going to jump back to this coastal flooding story map and demo these other features. So we've got, uh, we now have the ability to change the width of a sidecar block to be wider. You can go um, as far as halfway, if you want. Um, and within a specific map, for you map makers out there, you can disable map navigation. So if you want to really focus your readers on a specific section and you don't want them running off and exploring, you can do it that way. So you can see I can't uh, pan or zoom on the map. You can go in and um, enable that at any point. And you can add things like search, location, legends, um, like before. Now, another really exciting update is, um, is to express maps. So you can see that we have an express map that looks totally different than, than before. Um, we, you can now bring in new base maps as well as cluster various points. Um, let me show you how we did that. So here I've added a series of points. And as we zoom in, those clusters uh, expand out. Now here, I, you can modify this by just going into the settings and enable this group nearby points. Again, this is in beta, but it's a really powerful tool. You can also, you know, like I said earlier, you can disable navigation, um, which can be really helpful for things like locator maps and things that you want to be really, you know, very simple. To change the base map, you just click on the base maps here. And you can change it to be any number of these base maps. Um, and it's really easy that way. I know we're at three o'clock, and so if you have to go, I totally understand. Um, the last feature I wanted to show you um, is with embedding. Stephanie mentioned that it's really hard to kind of get your parameters just right. Now we've enabled this option to see your embed content uh, reference. So you can essentially 
see what your iframe code is or uh, how you're embedding, embedding it and uh, iterate from there. So it's a lot easier. Um, I'm going to cut the demo portion a little short and post this in the chat window. Um, this is a blog post outlining all of the latest updates. And so this is a really helpful link for everybody to um, go to. It walks through all of those various things that I just showed, as well as a couple other really exciting things. So I see that there's some questions. Typically, we have some time at the end for Q and A. Um, hopefully, my colleagues have been able to uh, field most of those questions, and um, I'm going to let them continue to answer those as I wrap things up here. Um, so you know, we're at our one hour. I want to thank our featured storytellers from uh, Grand Canyon Trust. Your work is really inspiring. Um, and we on the Story Maps team are really excited to uh, continue to see what you guys are making. And we want to help support you however we can. Um, these are some links here to consider as you want to gain more skills and things like that. Um, Again, like I mentioned, this video will be made available afterwards. Um, so if there's anything, I, I flew through that demo, so um, hopefully you'll be able to watch the video and uh, try those out in your new stories. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and want to thank uh, you all for taking the time to tune in to Story Much Live and thank our panelists. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, and thank everyone for joining us. <laughs> awesome. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.